you may be seated. And as you're seated this morning, if you will, open your Bibles to Galatians. We continue our study of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 20 today. Or you can look in your bulletin. We always print the Word of God in the bulletin, so you can take that with you. Or, you know, we'd like to have people who don't have a Bible, don't know the Lord, to be in our worship services. And so we have Scripture there for you as well. So if you will give special attention to the reading of God's Word. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean, the law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. This is God's word. You know, financial gurus strongly encourage us to diversify our income streams as well as our investments. Now, why do they promote Financial diversification. Well, they say it reduces risk and promotes security. What should that tell us about our income streams and our investments? They're 100% not reliable. In this passage, however, Paul does something extraordinary. He told the Galatians to not diversify your spiritual income and investments. Paul endorses a radically new approach, which was quite galvanizing at the time and still is today. Paul said we should bet the whole farm on one horse, as the saying goes. Paul explained that the only safe approach was to put all of your earthly and eternal eggs into one basket. This is counterintuitive, countercultural, and illogical. And the Jewish men who came down from Judea said that this was hyper risky and completely unsafe. And Paul, nevertheless, based his whole life on the singular and not the plural. And this is what you see from this passage. He says, not to offsprings, he's talking about the promise God made to Abraham, I mean, not offsprings, plural, but to offspring, singular, one. You'll notice the sermon title is One. You know, in the great game of baseball, it takes just one pitch to get out of an inning. It takes just one swing of the bat to win a game. It takes just one extra base to get another run. It just takes one. And Paul said, it just takes one. It just takes one. He says it's Christ. He is our one, and as you'll see in a minute, he is our intermediary. Now, it also says that God has chosen him as our one, the one. My dad just read to you a minute ago from our scripture reading, 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Paul practiced what he preached, and he put all his chips on one. He cashed them all in and said it's all about Christ. He gave up a lot. Paul gave up a lot. He had a lot of PhDs. He was a very brilliant man. He was up in the echelon of the Pharisees. And he cashed it all in and says, I'm going to put everything on Christ. And I'm going to go on three missionary journeys to preach this good news. Many of us would not do this. I know a guy who lived in my neighborhood. He had a great lawn care service that he started when he was in high school. He was making a lot of money. He decided to sell the business, and he moved his family down to South America to do missions. That's wild and radical. That's not what God calls us all to do, but maybe he does call you to do that. He called Paul to do it, and Paul says, I'm moving away from the safe, as it were. We think things are safe, right? 
God's the only one who makes things safe in our life. And he says, I'm going to move away from the safe, what I know, and I'm going to go and place it all on Christ so that many can hear this good news. Now, why would Paul support such a risky investment plan? Because Christ is 100% reliable. This is why when Paul speaks to those recalcitrant Corinthians who had everything they needed, and yet they had a lot of division in their church, he says these words in 1 Corinthians 4.8. He says, already you have all you want. They had everything they wanted, really, but they're, they're fighting with each other. He goes on and says, Artie, you have become rich. He's not talking about money. He's not talking about resources. He's talking about Christ. He says, you already have everything you need. Why are you fighting? Makes no sense whatsoever. You've misplaced your investments, your income stream. You've put it in the things of this world instead of putting it into Christ. So what's at the heart of this lengthy, complex, and a little bit confusing passage that we're about to look at? What in the world is this Pauline gibberish that you're reading? Well, he says the word one. It's the word ace in the Greek, which is uh, an E-I-S. But we could actually say it's A-C-E, ace, right? You have an ace in the hole. Well, Paul said, I have an ace in the hole. An ace is something that's advantageous. It, sits locked away in your pocket until you need to pull it out at the last minute. I just did this this past summer in baseball. We were having a horrible day at the plate, couldn't hit, everybody's striking out, our top three batters are not doing well. We get to the last inning, it's tied. So our first batter gets up, he gets, well he strikes out swinging, but the ball gets to the backstop, so he gets the first, a still into second. Uh, someone in this room who remained nameless came up second, moved him over to third. He gets to third base. I'm thinking, okay, we have one out. How are we going to get this guy in? Because we need to win the game. The other coach calls timeout, and he changes the catcher. Because when you're playing in 12U baseball, the catchers are most important. When there's a guy on third base, they're going to miss the baseball. So he changed the catcher, puts the best player behind the plate. I see what he's doing, and I thought to myself, how can I outcoach this guy? So I go into our dugout, I grab our batter who had struck out three times that day, and our runner who's on third base, and what do I do? I said, hey, here's what we're gonna do. And one of the coaches said, we're gonna, we're gonna bunt him in, aren't we? It's gonna be a squeeze play. I said, are you kidding? This guy can't bunt? <laughs> no, we're not gonna do that. I said, we're gonna do something even better. We're going to do a fake bunt. When you do a fake bunt, you square, and then you follow the ball all the way back to the catcher, and you mess with the catcher. And the catcher doesn't know what to do, and the ball goes to the backstop, and what happens? We could possibly win the game. So what happens in that first pitch? He squares, he follows it back, the ball goes to the backstop, here comes our guy from third base, we won, hooray, everybody's great. We had an ace in the hole. Paul says, I've got an ace in the hole. His name is Christ Jesus. How many of you need an ace in the hole today? You already have it. You've already become rich. You have everything you need. We don't feel that way, do we? Ho-hum, drum, dour Christians. Oh, it's so hard. No, we have everything we need. And Paul says, let's just go back and remember the one. And remember, he's talking to the Galatians who've been confused by false teachers. Those false teachers came in and said, you need Christ. Oh, but you've got to add to Christ. You've got to have circumcision as well. He says, no, no, no. It's just Christ. Bet everything on Christ. Give it all to Christ your whole life. So as we turn and look to this passage, let's see just two things. We're going to see point number one, one Christ. Revolutionary, right? One Christ. Point number two, one God. Straight from the passage. Let's go back and take a look at the one offspring who is Christ. Verses 15 through 18. Pay careful attention to God's word. He says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, it does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what I mean, the law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. How? Do these Galatians receive the inheritance? And that word inheritance is very important. It literally means in the Greek, a transcendent salvation. And that's what we all need, is a transcendent 
salvation. How are they going to receive this transcendent salvation? Performance or promise? He made it very clear. It's not about your performance. It's not about what you do. It's about the promise that God gave through Abraham. And it was a covenant, diathike. He goes back to the Old Testament, again, taking it further back than Moses. Because remember, the Judaizers said, we've got to keep the custom of Moses. And you need to be circumcised in order to be truly saved. The TR, I shouldn't say TR, the TS group. We know who the TR group is. Nevertheless, he says, let's go back to the covenant. Before the covenant with Moses, let's go back to the Abrahamic covenant. And if you'll remember, God cut a covenant with Abraham. This is very important for the Christian faith. God says, I'm going to promise you some amazing things like a son, land, be a blessing to the nations. And at a point later on, when Abraham was doubting God, God says, go get me a few things that we're going to sacrifice. He cuts them in two. And during the ancient Near East, the suzerain, who would have been the head king, and the vassal, who would have been the smaller king, so it would have been God as the suzerain and Abraham as the vassal, would have entered into a covenant. They would have cut a covenant. Now, here's the wonderful thing. Abraham falls asleep. Abraham should have been the one who walked through the pieces that were cut on each side, signifying if I break the covenant, the curse should fall on me. But Abraham falls asleep and a smoking pot and a fire torch passed through the covenant. What happened there? God says, when you break the covenant and you're going to break the covenant, the curse will fall on me. See, this is why grace is the Christian faith. It starts before the foundation of the world all the way through the covenants. God says, you're going to break it. But that curse is going to follow me. And we see this much later on in the New Testament when the curse fell on Christ. We talked about this last week. He took the curse to redeem us from the curse. God is so amazing and loving toward us. It's grace, grace, God's grace. But Paul goes on and he says there's something that came 430 years later. Now he doesn't call him out by name, but we know this is Moses and the Mosaic Covenant, but it's the law. So first, chronologically speaking, Abraham, the covenant, 430 years later, Moses, the covenant, and the law. And here he says, the law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul, does not rescind, does not void a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise Void. Now, when I use the word covenant, some of you think this is very sterile. This is kind of cold, distant, metallic. It's not. Covenant means a personal relationship. And God said, you can know that I love you because of the covenant that I've made with Abraham. And when Moses came along, it didn't change or annul the covenant that God had made with Abraham. It only signifies more of what God is doing in Moses' life. I want you to listen to this very carefully. The will that God sets forth, because God has a will, and when his son died on the cross, his last will and testament was read. Now, when Adrian and I had our first son, we went to Hap Smith's office. Now, some of you know Hap Smith, congratulations, big guy in Marietta. But we went to Hap Smith's office to get our will done so that if we died, everything would be fine and would go forward and our son could be taken care of and we'd have the people in place who would take care of him at the time. God also has a last will and testament. And the will holds despite new conditions. So the last will and testament, the covenant that he made with Abraham, though there are going to be new conditions, new things that happen, it doesn't change what he's promised. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. He will not change. This is why Malachi 3 says, I, the Lord, do not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Have you been doubting lately? Look at the covenant. Look to the covenant. Embrace the covenant. Love the covenant. If God has put this down on paper, as it were, and he has, he said, don't freak out. 
When you doubt, you can remember the covenant. Keep going back to the covenant, this covenant of grace. He's so good to us because we're sinners and we doubt. And we watch too much news and we doubt. And we look online and we doubt. And he says, go back to my word, my last will and testament. And remember what I've said to you, how I love you, I care for you. But how did God give it? Notice this language again in verse 18. He says, but God gave it. Now this word gave, you can circle it in your Bible, in your bulletin, whichever one you like to do. It's a verb in the perfect tense, which means God freely gave a gracious gift and it's good forever. It's not something he's going to repeal, not something he's going to take back. Whatever God has promised, he will do. What is this inheritance? Again, it's transcendent salvation, but it's not just merely salvation. It's salvation in perpetuity. Isn't that what we need? Something that's stable. I mean, if you've lived long enough, you know everything is not stable. <laughs> Incomes, stock market, housing, whatever. Your health, it's not stable. It comes and it goes. But God's promise of the inheritance that he gives to his offspring and thereby those who are in the offspring receive this inheritance. It's guaranteed, unlike anything in this world. Don't you need a guarantee today? And by the way, there's a difference between a promise covenant and a law covenant. Now, I want you to listen carefully because there's a huge difference. Promise covenant is what God makes. A law covenant is something that you do, that you enter into. A promise covenant is by grace and only comes through grace. All you have to do is believe. God said it's coming. It's coming. Just as if your parents said, when I die, here's the will. Here's what's coming to you. I remember sitting at John Moore's office. Some of you know John Moore. Congratulations. Another big name. Uh, I was sat in his, his office at his very difficult time, but when someone died in our family, and it was the reading of the will, and you know, I'm the guy who's got to unveil the will to show what's in there, and two people were shocked, couldn't believe it. But what's in there is guaranteed to happen. You get this amount of money, and you get this amount of money, and God says, you're going to get an inheritance if you're in Christ. I promise it. I guarantee. Here's my last will and testament. Go ahead and read it. The problem is, we have the last will and testament, but we're not reading it. We read everything else. I mean, you could tell a lot about the things of this world. You've been reading a lot, but the one thing we need to read is the last will and testament of God, who says it's a guarantee. Nothing will change my covenant. And it's a promise covenant over and against that law covenant. And that law covenant says you got to work. You know, that's every other world's religion is a law covenant. Work. You can get your salvation. You can earn your salvation. Keep working. Not the Christian faith. It says he's already worked so that you believe and receive. Therefore, if you want the inheritance, believe the covenantal promise and the performance of the one who is Christ. Well, then what then the law? Why then the law? I mean, Paul raises this question because it sounds great about all this covenant, and this inheritance, and everything's going to happen, but what about the law? Because, Paul, you just kind of glossed over it. Can we parse it a little bit? I want to see what is this law? Why is it so important? Well, this leads us to point number two. There's one God. Go back, look at the text, verses 19 through 20. He says, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Why then the law? Is God capricious? Does God change his mind? Did he ratify or change the covenant with Abraham by adding the law with Moses? No. He is one God. And the first use of the law is to show us, and really be a bright sharpie, to show us our sin. That's the first use of the law. We are sinners. How do we know? 
because of the law. Paul puts it this way in Romans 4.15. He says, for the law brings wrath. Don't you know that to be true? You read that Ten Commandments and you're like, I am underneath the wrath of God. I can't keep number one. We may have things that happened this week at our house and people broke covenants and or broke commandments and may have found themselves in a little bit of trouble. We have commandment breakers at my house. Do you have any at your house? I hope everyone is internally raising their hand at this point and you're not just saying, I'm glad they're here today. I'm glad I'm here today. I'm a commandment breaker. I don't worship God alone. There are a bunch of other things that I worship. And Paul says the law is there because we're a bunch of idiots. And we don't even know what sin is until we read the law. And we know that we sin against a holy God. However, those demands of that law were too much for us. There had to be one who could fulfill the law's demands. It's Christ, who is the offspring. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 3 verses 28 through 31. He says, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, and of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overturn the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. We're justified apart from works. We're justified by faith. But when we're justified, we also look to those commandments as a good guardrails from our Heavenly Fathers. Our Heavenly Father. Now, some of you have driven around in the mountains before. Maybe if you're coming back from Nashville, and there's this one particular place as you're coming down, it's a little steep, and you see there's a runoff for you know, semis in case they get a little out of control and they can run into it. But on the other side, there's just a huge cliff, and you're looking over thinking, oh my word, look at this beautiful scenery, but that's really far down there. What keeps you from going over the side? A guardrail. Our loving Heavenly Father gives us guardrails called the Ten Commandments. Remember, he never says, look at the law, do it, and you'll be saved. Because that's works-based salvation. He says, I saved you by grace. Now, look at the parameters. Look at the commandments. Look at the guardrails. These are here so that you can keep it in line. When we think that we know better than God and we can step outside of those guardrails, that's when you will find trouble. Maybe not right away. But initially, there's some things that will start to unfold. And the minute you step over that line, things begin to happen. Because you're going against God's commandments. And we walk those commandments out by His Spirit and by His grace. Now, why in the world does Paul put angels in here? I mean, have you, you read this passage, you're thinking, it seems a little bit out of place, doesn't it? I mean, he did mention angels at the very beginning in chapter 1. He said, if an angel or anyone else preaches another gospel to you, let them be anathema, let them be eternally damned. So what in the world is this angel section here? Well, Moses actually tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, he said, the Lord came from Sinai. He came from the 10,000 of his holy ones. He came with them. Somehow, when the Lord gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on the mountain, there were intermediaries because it's too much to stand in the presence of a holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I can't see his face. If I do, I'll go blind. His Shekinah glory is too much. So Moses said there were intermediaries. There were those who had to give, had to deliver the commandments. Now, if you've read anything in the Bible at any part about angels, and we can get into angelology, but we're not going to, but anytime you read anything in the scripture, when a human has an encounter with an angel, what do they do? Hello, fair guy, how are you doing? No, no, they hit the deck and they start worshiping the angel because their presence is magnificent. It's remarkable. They're created beings just like us, so what do they say? Get up, stop worshiping me. Created just like you. But for some reason, when we see them, we go, wow, 
I'm going to worship you. You're amazing. Moses said these intermediaries were there to give the law. Now, Paul goes on in this section, though, and says, but God is one. What is he doing? He says, well, there is one intermediary. There's only one intermediary. You can't have that access with a holy God, a sanctified, set-apart God, without Christ. And remember, what is Christ? What is Jesus? Very God and very man. He is the one mediator between God and man. Paul can't help but get that out in 1 Timothy. Why does this make any difference at all? God has one plan of salvation. Remember, before the foundation of the world, the Father, the Son, the Spirit make a covenant of redemption to redeem a people to themselves. Because God knew that we were going to sin and we would want to do things our way and we would be doomed for hell. God, however, steps in through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the unfolding of human history, God continues to make one covenant with man. It's the covenant of grace. See, the covenant of works with Adam failed miserably. And we have a covenant of grace, even though we continue to fail miserably. But what's that pointing us to? The intermediary. The Lord Jesus Christ, who would come and take on human flesh, live a perfect life, die on that cross for our sins. What's Paul saying in this passage? He says there's one. There's one covenantal God. There's one plan of salvation. There's one promise that will not be void. And there's one Christ who is our Savior. Today, if you're here and you don't know him, it might be a good time as we sing our hymn of response that you would place your faith and trust in him or maybe go to him for the first time in prayer. Begin to have a conversation. I don't know a whole lot about you, Christ. I, I don't know about all these things that guys that there's talking about and I see there's people here worshiping. If you don't know him, start that conversation today. We would love to talk with you about it and come see me. I'd love to take you to lunch. We can go to lunch and talk about these things. But maybe you're here and you do know Christ, but you haven't considered that his promises are yes and amen. They will not return void. Maybe you've had doubts this week. I mean, serious doubts. Maybe there's an illness. Maybe you received a phone call. We just talked about this young boy, Samuel Hood. He's 12 years old. Don't you know there's some doubts in that family? They're struggling. How would you like it if your 12 year old is struggling? I have a 12 year old in my house. Love that kid like crazy. I also have a 15 year old and a 17 year old. I don't love them as much. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. They're teenagers, right? Fun times, we can have humor. There's a time to laugh and a time to weep, right? Okay, just kidding. Sometimes you gotta loosen up. That's why we change the chair, chairs this way, but this way this morning, you know? Just change it up. Next week we're gonna have a circle. You can all just sit around me. Rick said we're going to put me on a lazy Susan. It would just spin me. That's a mechanical engineer for you. Fantastic. Nevertheless, are you trusting really in Christ? If you're having doubts, look to his covenant. His covenant is a guarantee that you'll receive the inheritance. And who here doesn't want an inheritance? And I'm not talking about the trash that's in your parents' or grandparents' basement. I'm talking about an inheritance that comes from our Heavenly Father through Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.